it's interesting in our messages, what we've been doing, if you're kind of new with this, is we're looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, a specific book of the Bible, which is what we call the book of Mark. But it's more than just a, a book. And if you are kind of new to, to Bible study or understanding the Word of God, one of the things that we've done over hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years, is we just, we just say, follow this book. And if you are, and I'm going to kind of age myself, um, but if you're over a certain age, some of this makes sense to you. Um, like, for instance, me, if you're over the age of like, what am I, 30? So if you're over the age of 30, 20, 29, something like that, um, you, you were taught, Jesus loves me, this I know, for what? The Bible tells me so. And, and I, base, I remember growing up in church, that's just the way it was. Then the internet world came in and, and everything was on the internet. I was having a conversation with one of my kids and, and this new AI, artificial intelligence stuff. We were talking about it and I don't really know what it does, what it will mean, how it will impact our culture. And if you were old enough to remember the institution of the internet back before it ever existed, we didn't really know what it was, what it meant, but it's such a vital part of our life. But with that came not just information, but disinformation. You could say whatever you wanted to, it didn't even have to be right. And so the younger generations <clears throat> are standoffish or they're just kinda, just cause I read it, doesn't mean it's true. And the younger generation understands that. That has transitioned over into the Word of God. And, and we're raising a culture now that when they see the Word of God, they would basically say, just because it says it doesn't necessarily mean I have to believe it. And so that's a problem. And so what we like to try to do is is to have a good foundation for what the Word of God specifically is. So the book of Mark, if you're over 30, 40, something like that, you just say, hey, the book of Mark, it's all good, I understand it, I believe it. If you're under that, um, it, it's more than just a book. It's actually a guy by the name of Peter, and he was on house arrest, and he was older at this time. He had walked with Jesus as a disciple, and him and a guy named John Mark we're in probably house arrest together uh, in the Roman Empire, and, and Peter was telling John Mark the stories of what happened with Jesus. So John, being very literate, would write it all down. Peter would actually die. Um, that would, he would end his life there. He would never leave the Roman Empire, whereas Mark would leave, go to Alexandria, Egypt, and then 300 years later, they took the, the book that Peter had told Mark what to write and Mark wrote it, they would take that along with all these other writings of Jesus and put it together in something called the Bible. And that's what we have today. So we've been going through the book of Mark to try to get an idea of what it would have been like to walk and talk with Jesus. So if you haven't been with us, um, let me give you just a little bit of a, a little bit of review I got that screen, I don't know what that is. Um, this is what happens when you take every electronic in the building all the way to Helena and then come back and try to hook it all up in a few hours. Um, so here's kind of a review of what we've done. And I hope for you that the Word of God comes alive. And when you read these stories, for instance, when I just told you in in 30 seconds, we went to Helena, we set up stuff, we came home, ministered to pastors, there was worship, Bible teaching, it was a great time. I gave you a snapshot of, of everything. I didn't tell you the inside jokes. I didn't tell you the, the fun things that we had. I didn't tell you the times when everything fell apart and we had to put it all back together, but you kind of have a basis for what happened. The same way in the Word of God. What I believe is that when we hear stories it would be dangerous for us to just read the stories 
and, and just say, okay, yeah, that, that happened and, and that's the whole story. You know that there's more behind it, but we don't know specifically what that is, but our minds allow us to look and to say, this was a real event. These real things happened to real people and we're getting a chance to review it. We're getting a chance to see what happened 2,000 years ago. So we started off and we said that Jesus was just teaching people over and over and over again. And he had one message. It said that he went into the Sea of Galilee and he was proclaiming the good news of God. Mark chapter one, verse 15 tells us what he was teaching. If you were to run into Jesus 2,000 years ago when he was alive on earth and he was teaching, he would say, the kingdom of God is near. And for us, what that means is the kingdom of God, every single thing for two-thirds of the Bible is, is building up to this event, building up to Jesus being here. And he would say the kingdom of God is near, which means we're so close to it. And so we spent a couple of weeks kind of examining that. We said that Jesus would remove religious obstacles we have this saying here at the Rock Church, and we would say that um, the gospel message is offensive, meaning you have basically nothing good to bring to the table. We just were broken people, and we have sin in our life. And so we come to Jesus with that brokenness, and Jesus saves us. And so we say that the gospel is offensive. Nothing else should be. We don't want to offend you with things that we do, or we don't want to tell you what you have to wear in church, or we don't want to say you can and can't do this type of stuff. We had one of the speakers in Helen, and he was talking about frequently when you walk into churches, um, and if you've, kept, if you've come from a church like this, I'm not bashing churches, I'm just saying you'll see a sign out in front of the, the foyer that says no food or drink in the auditorium. And so your very first interaction with the church is don't do this. Don't do this and don't do this. We, we just kind of have um, some godly people in our church. We just say, we'll just replace the carpet as much as we need to. Because if I were sitting in your shoes, I'd want some coffee. Or I would want something to drink. And I'm not going to try to spill it on purpose. But it, it happens. Then we're going to have sports camp, thank you, in a couple of weeks. And there's going to be 350 sweaty, stinky, muddy kids sitting on this carpet. And so we don't want to make... Let me use this word lightly. We don't want to make religion something that's offensive because I'm getting ready to tell you that you're broken. You have nothing good to bring to your heavenly father, but to him, that's okay. He saves you. He loves you. So if that message is offensive, nothing else should be. Jesus understood that. Jesus said that the church religion had gotten so um, enormous and there were so many rules that we had to follow and so when Jesus shows up he removes many of those obstacles he basically said if you want to see the kingdom of God here I am come to me you don't have to go through a priest you don't have to do some of these things that the Old Testament required that Jesus didn't do away with those but he fulfilled those and so we get to come to God and it worked he removed those obstacles so about 300 years later and the church put them right back in and so some of you have been burned by some of those things then we said that perfect faith basically means I'm confident that Jesus can do something and I'm hopeful that he will I'm confident that he could heal me if he wanted to and I'm hopeful that he will I'm confident that if he wanted to put this relationship back together he could and I'm hopeful that he will the week after that we said that there's a danger when religious leaders use the law of God to manipulate the people of God. You gotta follow these laws, gotta follow these rules, you gotta do this, you gotta act a certain way. And when that happens, we just misrepresent the love of God altogether. Then week four, we said that you're gonna come to a time in your life where you need faith and it's going to drive you to Jesus. But then consistent faith just keeps you there and the longer you've been a follower of Jesus and the more you've seen God do in your life what ends up happening is you just want to stay in the presence of God you want to stay there close now last week we basically said what is the kingdom of God what does that mean because we do use church words and we try not to the best we can 
But sometimes we use church words. We're like, kingdom of God is near. And we leave going, the kingdom of God is near. And someone's like, what's that? You're like, I have no idea, but it's near. And so we, we took some time and we kind of um, dissected what the kingdom of God is. So if you haven't watched that, that message is online on our different accounts. You can watch that uh, to try to understand what this kingdom of God is. And so imagine, if you will, Peter in house arrest sitting, and in my mind, and I know it probably wasn't like this, but in my mind, uh, Peter is like, he's in a lazy boy and he's got his feet up. He's kind of cranked back a little bit. And Mark's sitting there over on the couch with, with a pen and a paper and he's writing all this stuff down as quickly as he can. And Peter, I can just see him saying, I'm not saying that they had recliners and couches back in the first century. I don't know, maybe they were sitting on rocks. I don't know what they were sitting on, but I, I kind of wonder if Peter wouldn't have leaned back in his chair at one point and said, you know what I, I kind of realized about Jesus? He was always pushing us to do stuff. Now, remember, Peter's about 50 years old at this point. Jesus had, he had walked with Jesus. Jesus had died, um, had been buried, resurrected, visited with people after the resurrection, ascended into heaven, and then years had passed. So Peter was much older. Most theologians will tell you, this is going to blow your mind. Most theologians will tell you, once you reach, once a boy, a good Jewish boy, reached the age of five, he started his Jewish and Hebrew training, started learning about the, the, the Bible, learning about the Torah, learning what rules to follow in the Hebrew culture um, in order to be a good Jew. And then that happened until they were about 12 or 13 years old. At about 12 or 13 years old, they would seek out a rabbi to follow. And a rabbi was just a, a teacher of the law. So he would gather a group, you know, anywhere from five to maybe 15 some odd guys, um, and he would gather them and, and would teach them from about the age of 12 or 13 till about age 18, 15, 16, somewhere in there, and then they would go off on their own. This was the culture. And so with that in mind, it's safe to assume that the disciples most likely were somewhere between the ages of about 13 years old to maybe like 18 years old. So when we think of these disciples, in our mind, we're thinking, you know, these are grown men that have all this experience. These are teenage boys. Now, granted, the culture was a little bit different, and you're like, well, we read that Peter, Andrew, James, and we read that these guys were fishermen, um, but they started kids earlier back then, and it was just a different world, and I understand that. But these were young men who would eventually and physically overthrow the Roman Empire, uh, an empire that was designed to stamp out Jesus and forget Jesus. What started with these 12 men would overthrow the Roman Empire, would cause it to be the Christian Jesus capital of the world, and they did it as, as teenagers. So you don't think that student ministry and youth ministry in a church is important? Um, this is who Jesus picked. And so this is later. This is not as a young man. This is as a 50-year-old man. And Peter was like, Jesus, is, he's, he's always pushing us to do stuff. He could have done it himself, but he wanted us to do it. And you wonder, this isn't in the Bible. We're not sure. I'm just trying to get some of this to come alive. And you wonder if Mark looked over at him. He was like, well, you know, what kind of stuff? Were you good at it? Like, did, was there training? Did you know? And I think Peter would say, no, we were awful at it. But he kept doing it. He kept putting us in situations where, where the word of God could come to life, where the spirit of God could overtake us. And we were bad at a couple of examples. Um, he'd say, like, there was one time we tried to heal some people. And Jesus was healing people all the time. Jesus is like, you go do that. They're like, okay, cool, we'll do that. We're trying to cast out this demon and it wouldn't work. And so we finally, I don't know how that, that's a cool story of the Bible, but they tried to cast out this demon and it didn't work. And then they just left. They're like, all right, we're out. You know, and, and the guy's still possessed with the demon. They're like, Jesus, we tried to do it. Jesus is like, did you pray? And they're like, ah, I knew we forgot something. And, and, and Jesus would, would teach him and would tell them how to do those type, types of things. 
Peter would say, I remember there was another time where he said he's going to make us fishers of men. And, and we knew how to fish and we got skunked all night. Homeboy shows up in the middle of the morning, tells us to push our boat out a little bit and we catch more fish than we've ever caught in our entire life. So we can't, we couldn't heal people, found out we weren't even really that good fishermen, and, and Jesus was just constantly push, pushing us. One time there was a storm, they were rowing this boat, and we're used to storms, they happen all the time, and so we're rowing this boat, and the waves are getting too bad. Jesus is asleep. We wake him up, and he just stands up, and he's like, stop. And the winds and the waves obeyed this man. And so Jesus is walking, John, or Peter, excuse me, is walking John Mark through these stories of, of what happened years ago so that we get a chance and the rest of the world gets a chance to see it. Um, he says there was a time where he sent us out in groups of two into different towns to tell people the good news. And we would preach the same thing that Jesus preached, that the kingdom of God had come near. Repent, believe the good news. There were some good times and there were some bad times, but that was Jesus's mantra. Now, for us, think about that. Jesus only had about three years of ministry. And during that time, he decided instead of doing it all himself, which I hope everyone in here would say, of course, he could have done it all himself. He used a group of teenage boys, uh, uh, some young men to do it for him so that when Jesus left, when Jesus ascended into heaven, the movement still went. I can almost see Peter sitting there saying it was just time after time Jesus was showing us that if we had some faith that we could do amazing things. And to be honest, Peter would say, I never really signed up for that. I mean, I followed Jesus because he caught a bunch of fish and he said, follow me. And so I did. And then what happened in the years following that, in the short three years following that, changed my life forever. And now Peter is telling that story. Um, there's a verse uh, in, in John chapter 14 where Jesus tells his disciples, and I almost think Peter was like, John would tell us this later because the book of John hadn't been written yet. It would come years after that. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. We were like, do the works that you do. We've seen you do some amazing things. And, and you literally tell us that we're going to do that, but that's not all. Then he said, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Jesus said, guys, I've done some pretty amazing stuff, but you're going to do even more. I think Peter may have kicked back at his chair and said, I don't, I wanted to believe it, but I just see failure after failure after failure when we tried to do stuff and it wasn't working the way it should. We couldn't even catch fish. And that's what we were. We were fishermen until Jesus showed up. Here's what's interesting, and I don't want us to miss this. Here was Jesus' invitation to everyone. If Jesus were to meet you, um, he may heal a physical ailment. He may deal with some physical needs. Then he would deal with your spiritual needs. But here was Jesus' invitation. Follow me. And you understand that. If I were to say, hey, follow me, you, you would know what that meant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you do. I'm going to go where you go. And this was super clear until the church came along. The church came along and we jacked this one up because we changed it from follow me to believe in me. And if you've been in church for a long time, you can see this happening. We, we don't tell people as much now to follow Jesus. We say believe in Jesus. And this is a part of it, but it was not Jesus' original invitation. His original invitation was follow me, and he never shifted from that. There was never a point in the Bible where he's like, all right, now that you follow me, all you have to do is believe. What does that mean for us? There's a part of being a follower of Jesus that means you actually follow him. You do what he did. You, you go where he you understood his teachings and you taught the same thing. 
It's so much more than just believing in Jesus. There's a lot of things that I believe. Doesn't mean I care about them. Doesn't mean that I'm interested in them. But when you follow someone, when you go and you do what they do, so you can see this transition over the years taking place from follow me to believe in me. But Jesus would say, no, 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 let's get back to what it originally was, literally, follow me. So here's what, here's what happens. This is kind of interesting in this story. Remember, these are younger kids, younger young men, and, and they, would, they were teaching about stuff. They were learning what Jesus would do. There's one story that all four Gospels mention. When I say Gospels, I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of these books. So Matthew, disciple of Jesus, he wrote his own um, account of walking with Jesus. Mark, I just told you, Peter told Mark. Mark wrote it down. Luke was a doctor. Luke was different. Luke basically had a guy that pretty much, we think, hired him to say, tell me about Jesus. And so Luke was asking, interviewing, writing around, and, and he ended up writing the book of Luke. And then John, very similar to Matthew, John walked with Jesus. So he was just writing his own account. All four of these guys mentioned this story. Doesn't mean that it's more important than the others, but I think to these four guys, it was like there was one time when something happened that totally blew us away. So much so that four different gospels, all of them say this. Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, John 6, they all teach this story. And I'm going to try my best to kind of walk you through what it was um, in, in the first century. But then we're also going to try to remove some myths and show you what that might have looked like today. So um, leader of this area, Herod Antipas, had just beheaded John the Baptist. And word gets to Jesus that John the Baptist had, had been beheaded and he is dead. And that's going to affect Jesus, right? So what does Jesus do? He, he basically says, guys, you got this for a while. And he went off by himself. And when he went off by himself, some of the disciples followed him. And so they're just hanging around. There's just, there's just them, and they're mourning the death of their loved one. If you've ever um, gone to a hospital, if you've ever left a funeral, this is why, this is why road rage kind of gets, gets me all flustered. Um, you never know what people are going through, right? Like if there's someone sitting at the hospital downtown and, and there's a four-way stop and they didn't go when they, they should and someone like honks at them. Like, for all we know, they just lost a loved one. For all we know, they're dealing with something. Is my life really that messed up because I'm three seconds later because you didn't go through the stop sign at the right time and you never know what people are dealing with? They had no idea what Jesus was dealing with. So the crowd followed Jesus. Now, don't miss this. Why the crowd followed Jesus? It wasn't because they wanted to be better church people. But he was healing, and he was feeding them, and so they would flock to him. I can see this happening. I've been in church work long enough to know I can see how this would, would pan out. Jesus and his disciples were over kind of by themselves. They're kind of going through this thing with John the Baptist. They're sad. They're mourning the loss of their friend. And then they just kind of see a few people, and a few people turns into a group, and the group turns into hundreds of people, and pretty soon thousands of people are coming. In church work, in, in, in your work, in family life, you may say, hey, guys, let's try to find a quieter place, right? Let's hop in the boat, go out in the middle of the ocean, and just, let's, just, let's just be by ourselves. But Jesus didn't. And I think Peter would have said, Mark, what happened was that when we saw the crowd, Jesus, maybe even through his tears from mourning his friend, we don't know that, but, but maybe through his tears, Jesus just kind of stood up and said, let's go to work. Let's minister to these people. Jesus, don't you need to mourn? Don't you need to rest? And Jesus was just laser focused on other people. And so this big crowd is coming and Jesus would teach them. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of my, my notes here, but uh, he would, Mark 6, 31, 
Here's Mark's account of this. He said, and he said to them, come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And so this crowd begins to build and things begin to change. This rest didn't last long because verse 33 says, now many saw them coming and recognized them and they ran there on foot from all of the towns and got there ahead of them. So they're, they're just finding out where Jesus is and the masses are flocking to him. Verse 34, then here's the part where I just told you about. When he went ashore, saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. And then Peter was like, it was almost as if, it was almost as if they were like, like sheep without a shepherd and Jesus knew that and so what did he do he began to teach him what did he teach him kingdom of God is near repent and believe the good news and so Peter's telling Mark this story along with the other disciples here's where it gets interesting um there's thousands of people and it's getting dark um back then there weren't drive throughs and there wasn't refrigeration. You couldn't just go home and, and eat a cheese sandwich. I mean, it was a little bit more difficult than that. And we know from the different accounts, there's 5,000 men. Some of the other gospel writers say 5,000 men, not including women and children. So I don't know how many that would be. No one really knows. Let's just say there's 15,000 people. Pretty similar to what the Metra holds. So if you've ever been in a packed house there, that is the size we're talking about. And it's getting dark. There's no place open to get food. And, and they realize Jesus is on a roll. He's teaching. He's healing. Um, this is going well. But we got to feed these people. So let's, let's like take a time out. We'll do a part two on your message tomorrow. Maybe we'll even live stream it. And Mark was like, what's live stream? He's like, oh, yeah, never mind. You won't understand that till later. But, but let's, let's, let's do pick up part two so that these people can go eat. They got to make it back to their towns in time to swing by the market or maybe go to their house or whatever and eat because they needed food for that day. All of the disciples um, were understanding this and then all of the gospel writers communicated the same thing. This is, this is one of my favorite favorite things and here's where i want you to understand this so imagine there's 12 of us okay and we are at the metra and it's packed and and i'm i'm there getting a chance to preach to a packed out metra crowd and the concession stands are closed and everyone's hungry and so you 12 come up to me and they're like hey greg we got to feed all these people um because they haven't had anything to eat. And I were to say to you what Jesus said to them. And I were to say, he answered them, you give him something to eat. I don't know when the last time you've been to a sporting event was, but like the hot dogs, like $12 is a good hot dog, but it ain't a $12 hot dog. And so all the concession stands are closed. There's 12 of us. There's a metro full of people. And I were to say, well, you guys feed them. You would look at me like I was crazy. And that's exactly what they did. Matter of fact, it was so crazy, they kind of got sarcastic and they kind of started making fun of the situation to try to figure out what in the world was he teaching. And I think Peter would have said, Mark, I didn't understand it then because I was caught up in the, you give them something to eat? I mean, seriously, one of the disciples piped up and he's like, um, if we had 200 times a daily wage, we still couldn't feed these people. Translate that to, if we had $50,000 cash, we still couldn't feed these people. I mean, what do you mean you give them something to eat? And it kind of gets more sarcastic. John tells us, um, a little bit different. So that's why I love the Gospels. You get a little bit different, uh, same story, but different sides of it. And John would actually tell us, Jesus went up to one of the guys and he's like, what do you think we ought to do with these things? What do you, what do you think we ought to feed them? Did you bring your, 
your, your Blackstone, you whip up some fried rice or something, you didn't bring any of that. How are we going to do it? And then John says, but you know what? He did that just to test them. And you know what they got on the test? An F. They failed because then they started making fun of Jesus. And here's, I don't know how it went down, but basically Jesus was teaching them and he was saying, you go feed them. And the last part of the verse that I just mentioned, he said, he go to them, shall we buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And all the disciples were like, <laughs> like that's funny. Where are we going to come up with that type of money? And during that time, Andrew, one of the other gospel writers tells us, saw a little boy with a little bag lunch. And I think here's what happened. I, th I think he was talking to Jesus and Jesus is having the conversation. He's like, what can we feed these people? There's a pack, there's 15 some odd thousand people. He sees this little boy with a lunch and he goes and gets it from the boy. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. And he goes to Jesus with a kid's meal He's like, how about this? And there's no way you can take that seriously. You can't. You can't read that in your vacation Bible school head and, and think that that was serious. Nancy, you don't happen to have a kid's meal with you, do you? Nancy has everything. I tell you, this woman, she has everything we need. So... Go, Norm, you're a lucky man. I don't, I don't know if it's your looks or your money, but keep her around, brother. She's a, I think the way this would have happened is, is don't, don't get too spiritual about it. There's 12 of us. There's a metro full of people. You've seen the parking lot. You've seen the masses. And, and one guy walks up and he's like, well, here's what we got. Let's feed them. You would have laughed. Because this is absolutely bizarre to think about. Now, the Bible then tells us um, in, in verse 38, he says, And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, We have five loaves and two fish. Now, when I was in, uh, boy, this just looks with a Chick-fil-A bag on Sunday. It just looks you know, like a picture for Chick-fil-A. They should buy that from us. Um, if, if I, when I was in vacation Bible school, Mrs. Nissendirk, my third grade teacher, she would have a felt board and a bunch of little guys on there and palm tree because the palm tree was everywhere. It was glued onto the felt board so you couldn't take it off. But um, I can't wait to get to heaven and see that palm tree. But still, these guys, and then she would pull out of her apron like five loaves and two fish. Now, in our mind, when I think of a loaf of bread, I'm thinking like a French loaf of bread. And when you see pictures in the Bible, and if, don't look through your kid's Bible because it's probably going to show this, but that's okay. You, you see like, like fish, like, like trout or, or herring, or I don't know what kind of fish it was. You see like a full fish. Okay, time out. What boy is going to be walking around doing life carrying five loaves and a couple of dead rotting fish? That, that's not at all what happened. What basically we think in that culture meant was that this guy showed up with five little pieces of bread. And the fish, obviously, we would assume had either been processed or more likely salted. And so he would have crackers and the fish part was probably mixed into a paste or something, and it was like something you'd spread over a cracker and it'd be enough to feed a little kid. So this is a, a kid's meal. So imagine five little crackers, and we didn't have fish, but we do have Chick-fil-A nuggets. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And just for good measure, in case you missed last week's sermon, Chick-fil-A sauce, because it's just, it's just amazing. Now, that's what they have to feed 15,000 people. And no one took it seriously. And I think at that moment, Jesus decided, you know what? I'm going to take your silly, sarcastic, making fun of, taking lightly. I'm going to take this little joke 
And I'm going to show you when you have enough faith and it intersects with the power of God, I'm going to show you what can happen. And I, I kind of wonder, I think Jesus may have chuckled a little bit when he brought up the little kid's meal. And Jesus would have chuckled. and He told his heavenly father, he's like, yeah, watch this. This is where the story just takes a total cosmic turn. Don't miss this. You're part of the 12. We have 15,000 people that we're getting ready um, to feed. Then in the next couple of verses, he begins to unpack why they're doing this and how it's going to work. This is where I think the miracle happens. So um, if you look at the next verse, he says, have them sit down. Put them in groups and have them sit down. And the disciples are like, okay, this is weird, but all right. So they had them sit down in groups. Then verse 41, here's where this, this miracle takes place, although it hasn't happened yet. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing, blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples set for the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. Um, I still, I, I just, I know it. And I'm going to ask one of them when I get to heaven. In the middle of this prayer, did you laugh? Like, I, I want to ask Peter or I want to ask Bart. I'd be like, Matt, when you and Jimmy were watching this prayer and, and Jesus takes basically this and, and raises his hands to heaven or however he did it, and he said, God, bless this food that we're about to give 15,000 people. Bart's over here like, <laughs> like, yeah, right. Like, are we really going to do this? Then this is the most important part of the verse. I think the miracle had not happened yet. The miracle had not happened because it says, and he divided the two fish among them all. So imagine if you were to come up here and I were to say, all right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take part of this cracker, right? Because I, I, can't, I can't give you all of it because I got 12 guys. So I'm just going to give you one twelfth of the crackers. And, and then we only have two little things of fish. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a little bit. And, and this is what you get right here. And I'm going to give it to all 12 of these people because I don't believe that the miracle had happened at this point. And you're holding this, and Jesus basically says, go feed them. That's where I think the faith came in. I just wonder, I don't want to turn my back on you, but I just wonder in this little circle, and they're praying, and Jesus passes it out, and I'm a disciple, and I'm looking at this, and there's 15,000 people behind me, and Jesus says, Go. Go feed them. How, how would that have happened? Imagine the faith of me walking to the first group of people. That's where I think the faith came in. Now, because we're on video and lights, I don't want to go down. Chuck, could you just come stand right here for just a second? Imagine that Chuck is the first group. So Jesus gives me what I have, and I walk up to Chuck, Chuck's group. Another gospel writer says they're probably in groups of 50. And I were to say, you hungry? Chuck's like, yeah, we're hungry. You can't go back and buy food. And I'm like, well, today's your lucky day because here's what I got for you. <laughs> and, and, and I think what would happen is I think I would go, there's that. <laughs> Eat up. Now, and so he, he walks back to his seat to his wife, and he's like, what'd you get? He's like, oh, I don't get too excited yet. Um, and so he, and he passes it around, and, and I think most likely, although we don't know, that's kind of when the miracle happened. He passed it, and by the time we get down to Norm, Norm has like a full chicken nugget and a full cracker, and they're, they're passing it around, and, and by the time it gets to Roger, Roger's got a full chicken sandwich, waffle fries, and a side salad. <laughs> now, here's the one part where I'm going to have to ask when I get to heaven. Chuck looks over his shoulder at Roger. He's like, look at that. Because Chuck still has, he's like, can I get some of that? He's like, yeah, I got plenty. And so you know the story. What ends up happening is they fed 
everyone. And when they did that, they had so much left over that there were 12 baskets. Why 12 baskets? Because of chance? No, because those 12 men decided to lean into Jesus and put their faith as they're walking from this prayer circle to a group of 15,000 people with food that you can hold in your hand. And, and I imagine them watching this take place and pretty soon there's just all this food left over and they begin to realize whether we were joking or not, Jesus took something that we thought was absolutely impossible and he made it work. I believe this is why all four gospel accounts mention it. All four gospel accounts mention why this was so incredibly significant. I don't know if you have to hold that or if you already ate it or what, but I'm sorry, I just gave that to you. Um, what, when we start thinking, what, what would cause them to do such a thing? Now, here's what I think would cause them to do such a thing. Here's where the disconnect happens in, in our 12 and their 12. What they understood for walking with Jesus just a short time, and you can write this in your notes, is that faith in Jesus is the, is the foundation, is the plumb line, is the, is the bottom, is the end result. It's the beginning of the kingdom of God. I, I kind of wonder if, if there weren't a couple of disciples that were scared. If you've ever met really hungry or thirsty people, and, and you don't have enough for them? I mean, you're thinking, what, are they going to jump me and take all of it? I mean, there, there probably were some of them that were kind of worried about how this is going to happen, but they knew this. Every time Jesus does this, something amazing happens. And their faith in Jesus, they understood, was the foundation of the kingdom of God. And they, they wouldn't ever let that go. Matthew gives us some important detail, which is kind of the, the, the center of this story. In the book of Matthew, he says, they said to him, we only have five loaves and we only have two fish. The next verse, I think, is key. And Jesus, he and Jesus said, bring them here to me. Just in this one little verse, it gives me some hope thinking that Jesus, there are so many things that I can't do. There are so many things I'm not good enough. There's so many things I'm worried about. And I think Jesus would say, whatever you have, bring it to me. Don't, don't try to do it yourself, but bring it to me first. There are so many illustrations in this, but if you feel inadequate, feel like you can't do it, feel like you're not good enough, you don't have enough knowledge, you don't have enough information, Jesus would say, first step, come to me. Remember last week, we said true faith drives us to Jesus. Consistent faith keeps us there. And so here again, Jesus is saying, just bring Bring it to me. No matter what you have, bring it to me. And here's our lesson in this. When we do that everything that we can do, then God will do what only he can do. When we do everything that we can do, this is all I got, little, hap, little kid's meal that we're going to feed, I'm going to take it to Jesus. When we do that, God will do what only he can do. And I wonder, Peter and Mark had this conversation. And they're like, well, why didn't Jesus just do it himself? Why, why did you guys have to go do that? Or here's an easier fix. Skip that all together. Have Jesus just raise his hands to heaven and say, Heavenly Father, fill the stomachs of the people that are here. And then all of a sudden, all 15,000 were like, oh, I got a heartburn. I am stuffed. <laughs> right? Could have happened, but he didn't. There's a, <clears throat> I've challenged some of you. Clayton and I had a long, drawn-out conversation about it, and he was right on a couple things. There's a, uh, I, I challenged you a while ago. You go look through the Bible. Try to find an example where God acted on his own without using people. The only real one, there's a couple others that we could maybe argue, the only real one I could think about is creation. Didn't, didn't use any of us to get it started. But from Genesis chapter 2 through the remainder of the Bible, you see a very important trend. God could have done it. He had the power to do it. 
and he didn't need our help. But in light of that, he used people to carry out his word, to carry out his will for our lives. Well, why couldn't have Jesus just done it by himself? I don't know, but he didn't. Not only that, there's not a good example that I can find, and maybe you can't find either. There's not a good example where God did that. He uses you. He uses me. And, and when we do everything that we can do, then God will do what only he can do, and he never does it by himself. You may think, well, well the resurrection, and true, God didn't need us to bring Jesus back from the dead, but he did use us to crucify Jesus to begin with. And so we are all over the pages of the New Testament, even the Old Testament. When God wants to move, he's going to do it through you. Put the brakes on just for a second because you may be thinking, well, I have a son or a daughter who they were raised in church. They, they, uh, they loved Jesus. We went as a family and then they got older and they stopped going to church. And they got married and now their family doesn't go to church, and it breaks your heart. Because you would say they weren't raised like that. And you, you would say that they, that's not exactly how we planned it to be. So I believe God wants to save my son or my daughter and, and, and get them back into church and, and, and move forward. Why doesn't he just do it? I have no idea why, but when you look through the Bible... You don't find an example of God just doing it on his own. He's going to use you. You're like, well, me, I'm, I'm his mom or I'm his dad. I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know. How would I do that? I think Jesus would say, bring it to me. Come to me and I, I will show you. Jesus, don't you want them to be saved? Jesus would say, yes, absolutely I do. But I want to use you. And I... I, I, I don't have a plan B because you are the one. Once we do everything that we can do, you will find throughout eternity that God will do what only he can do. I wish it weren't like that at times, but you see it every single time you read a story in the Bible that God uses us. So what does that mean for us? Your relationships, your prodigal children, your, your struggles with money, does God want to fix all that stuff? Yes. Now, I believe he does want to use your faith to grow during that time, obviously. But yes, he wants you to, to have all these issues fixed, but he's going to use people. He's going to use you to do it. And so many of us in churches are sitting around waiting for someone else to do something. And God would say, I, I want to use you to do it. When we do everything that we can do, then God will do what only he can do. What we understand through this story, Jesus is radically focused on serving other people and using people to do it. Using you and I to serve other people. So if we are, and if I go back up here to the front, if, if we're like, yeah, I believe, but more importantly, I want to follow. So if we decide we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to actually do what he did, then that means God use me. Use me in the life of the church. Use me in the life of my home. Use me in my workplace environment. Whatever it is that you do, you, use me. And when I said that, there's half, more than half, that would say, well, I, I can't do anything. I don't have any skills. I don't know. I still even found the book of Mark. I don't, I don't know anything about this stuff. And then Jesus would say, bring it to me. Whatever you have, bring it to me. Because when you do everything that you can do, then God will do what only he could do. Imagine if we were to get back to this invitation. Imagine if we were to move back to this follow me, not just believe in me, but just us, just this group of people, there's a lot more than 12, just us. And we were to start to follow Jesus. Do you realize what type of radical change that would make in the lives of people? It would change this city. Yes, we're going to believe, but more importantly, we're going to follow. 
And we're going to do what Jesus did. Here's my argument. I guarantee there are things that Jesus has given you, skills, ideas, thoughts, talents, that God has given you. And the only reason he gave them to you is to serve in his kingdom. He gave them to you so that you could be a blessing. Some of you just you have skills, you have talents. You don't have those just for your own good. You have those for the good of the kingdom because the kingdom is near. If the kingdom is near, that means you're so close to it. And so we use that for the will of God. And Jesus would say, I'm not going to abandon that. That's the way it started in the beginning, and that's the way we're going to end. He's going to use people. He's going to use you and I to truly accomplish his work. And I know that most of you believe, but I would also say that doing is the evidence of truly believing, right? I mean, you can tell me that you believe. You can tell me that it's a big deal to you. You can tell me all this stuff. But I would say that doing is the evidence of truly believing. It's not what causes the belief. I'm not saying that you have to do works in order to be saved. The Bible teaches against that. But he does say that faith without works is dead. Because doing is the evidence of truly believing. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you're going to want to do something. You're going to want to get involved. You're going to want to use your talents, use your abilities for the kingdom of God. Because you truly want to follow Jesus. Here's the big question. Do what? Right? So we'd say, what, what is it that we're, we're supposed to do? Years later, a guy by the name of Paul would write a bunch of letters to churches. Basically say, now that Jesus is in heaven, ascended to God, um, here's what I want you to do. And in one of those, to a group in Galatia, he would write something that's so significant. He would say, so do what? That's your question? Here's the answer. So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Every single person. You want to know what to do? You do good to everyone. That's hard, isn't it? Because there are some people that don't deserve my goodness, right? I mean, I'm just being honest with you. In my mind and in your mind, I know it's not just me. We'd say there's some people that I, I don't want to be nice to. I don't want to be good to because they're this and they're that and they're the other thing. It's just a few illustrations later. Jesus would say, not only this, do good to everyone, but especially your enemies. Especially the people that you can't stand. Because that's what following Jesus means. I could name some names. I'm not going to because it's an election year. But you could name some names and it would make your skin crawl. You'd be like, I can't stand that person. Let me say, brother, I'm right there with you. And Jesus would say, do good to those. Yeah, but they're teaching this and they want to do this and they want to do that. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know they're broken. Do good to everyone, even the people you can't stand. Then he goes on and he says, and especially to those who are in the household of faith, especially your faith family, because we're all walking the same road. We're all walking and dealing with issues the exact same. So, so be good. Do good to everyone. And once you do everything that you can do, then God will do what only he can do. I pray for us that, that this will increase our capacity to, to bless people, to provide for people, to help people in a world that's cynical and jaded and they can't stand Jesus, and they can't stand church, those are the people that we take the gospel to. Those are the people that we do good to. I don't want to overstate or state something that you may not know, but if you know anyone in the restaurant business, a lot of them will tell you that one of the worst days of the week to work is, is Sundays. That they would rather work with a bunch of drunk people on Saturday night than they would church people on Sunday afternoon. Because sometimes they're just mean. And we've forgotten this. 
We've forgotten Jesus saying, you do good to everyone, even those who are in the household of faith, especially to those, but everyone else we do good to. Some of you understand this. Some of you, you live by this. I could give you names. I don't want to embarrass people, but I could give you names of people you live by this. There's others of us that would say, yeah, probably not the best at this. This is probably not something that, that I'm good at and maybe I need to work on it. There's a rule in organizational science called the 80-20 principle. Basically means that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Um, there are 20% of the people that you understand this, but the majority don't. And we just kind of kind of go through life. I want, I want us as a faith family to be marked by serving others and, and, and bring it to Jesus, whatever you got. Well, I don't have much. And some of you are thinking, I don't, I don't have anything that some of these other people have. All I have are five loaves and a couple pieces of fish. That's all I got. Jesus would say, bring it to me. Let me show you what faith can do when it encounters the power of God. My job as pastor, this may come as a shock to some of you, my job as a pastor is not, not to serve you. Now, my role as a Christian, of course, I want to serve you. My job as a pastor is not to serve you. My job as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to teach you and me to serve everyone else. I could serve people, and I could get to quite a few of them. How many could we all serve? We could change this town because Jesus is radically concerned about serving other people. We are the only plan. And Jesus wants to use us. Ephesians 4 basically says that we train everyone so that they can serve other people. So hopefully, you're willing to do everything that you can do and have faith that God will do what only he can do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me just for a minute. I realize that this can take several different looks as a follower of Jesus. Of those of you that, that understand this, man, keep doing it. Keep doing good to other people. Keep preaching Jesus. Keep sharing the good news. There's others of us in here that you would say, yeah, I'm probably not the nicest person. And, and, and in our defense, I just get irritated about stuff. And I get angry about it. And I just wish it were this way. And it's not this way. And so I just get mad. I think Jesus would say, you can, you can get upset with it, but still do good. It doesn't say do good to everyone, but only if you're right. It says, do good to everyone, to serve other people. Just in this room, there's enough power, I guarantee, to change the city of Laurel and the state of Montana. And so we use that for the kingdom. There's others that you're praying through things and you're like, why hasn't God answered? Why hasn't God healed? Why hasn't God fixed this? Could it be that he wants to use you? So maybe your prayer today is, God, how, how can I play a part in fixing this thing that I'm in? How can I play a part of being a part of the solution? Who can we share this good news with and who can we serve? Well, I pray out loud. I want to encourage you to do business with your Heavenly Father this morning. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for the wonderful blessings you've given to us as followers of Jesus. God, I pray that we as a church, me as a pastor, that we go back to the follow me, not just believe in me. God, that you would call us out, that you would give us those things that we need to love and to serve others. That you would identify those in the lives of your people. And for those that think they have nothing, that they would bring you what they have. God, we want to be that that place where people can find Jesus. We want to serve in big ways. We want to serve in small ways. But more than that, we want to push everyone to you. We want the cross to be the center of everything that we do. 
God, if we ever stray away from that, bring us back onto the focus of Jesus Christ. God, we as a church, people as families or as business owners, teachers and people that understand and are in the community, that we would make the cross the central focus of everything that we do. And we would just keep pointing people to Jesus because we believe that's what we've seen in the disciples and we want to replicate that. God, give us the faith that it takes to feed 15,000 people with a kid's meal, knowing it, it's not us, but the power of God. We pray that lives are changed, that families are healed, that children and adults come to faith in you through salvation for all of eternity. And we learn not just to believe, but to follow. Thank you for the clarity of your word. May it change us forever. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.